Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. Just over two weeks ago, there was a scandalous crime in Liverpool, and the would be killer is still at large. And tonight, uh, these detectives here are looking to Crime Watch viewers to name him. A whole family was shot, including a child who was just six years old. It was a Sunday evening. Earlier on that day, he's had a Sunday roast. Valerie was settled on the couch. Adrian had decided to go and make himself a sandwich. He's always been kind of protective of, of, of the others, littler ones, because he's the oldest. Well, McKayden is like most other six year olds, full of life. Don't McKayden, has on food. Just a little bit. She's just an ordinary little girl that is special, like any little girl who's in your family. Mum! Do you want mayo? Whilst they were in the kitchen, um, they heard a knock at the door. I'll get it. Leave him okay, then I'll get it. I just have to do it. She did open it anyway, only because it was thought it was um, a friend of the family who'd come. Can I have your brother, please? But when she's done that, he's stepped into the house at the same time, and as far as I know, all hell's broke loose from there. Come here. Come here, I want to speak to you a minute. Where's your dad? Adrian, he's been hit in the leg. He's ran upstairs into the top of the house. McKay doesn't remember being directly shot at. However, she does remember something going into her arm. It wasn't until she looked down that she seen blood We give thanks for the dog because it seemed like the dog saved Agent's life and gave him that little few seconds just to get away and he's, he's run up to the police station. <laughs> Valley says she knew she'd been hit, so the best thing for her to do was to stay still. She says she's kind of froze. This was a situation that happened to this mother with her children. Um, everything they done, from Adrian to Makeda, everything they done, they done because that was their reaction at the time. It wasn't, um, oh, I've seen this on a film or I've seen that on a film. They done what they felt they needed to do to survive at that moment. I think they've all been very brave in the situation. Physically, as I say, they, they, they'll all heal. But psychologically, I don't know what scars are going to be left. At the best part of our life, we're vulnerable. But for a six-year-old to have someone come in, shoot her, shoot her, shoot her brother, shoot her mother, out, you know, how is she supposed to cope with that? I mean, it's changed a six-year-old's... Um, perspective on life for the rest of her life. She just sees things differently now. Detective Chief Superintendent Mike Langdon is from Merseyside Police, and shocking though that reconstruction was, we couldn't have show half the violence, the aggression of that. No, he's obviously a very dangerous and chaotic, unpredictable criminal. Um, obviously that unpredictability has probably given us some opportunists, certainly forensically, um, when he shot the dog dead. Um, we think before that the dog may well have bit the gunman's arm, which may give us some DNA opportunities. And also, as you saw in the film, the discarding of the bag, we also think that'll give us opportunities. W was he bitten in such a way he went, went through the garments? Or would he have been injured, do you know? Well, he would have been injured if the dog took hold of his arm, obviously, before he shot the dog dead. But um, So there's a might... possibility that friends, relatives, or perhaps he even sought medical, sought medical attention would, would have seen that sort of wound? I'm hoping so, yes. And you've got a very, very good description of him indeed. Yes, we have got a good description. It's a good e-fit likeness. He's, he's quite tall. He's six foot and he's, um, he's medium slim build. Um, also, I think these poke out eyes, is, as it's described, and crooked teeth. We can't see the crooked teeth here, of course. Now, how do you know, I mean, you, you described this as a very, very good effect. You told me this beforehand. How, how do you know how good it is? Well, McCade was watching the television with the, the sound turned down low, and um, the effect appeared. And she said, Mum, 
that's the man that shot me. And I think that's very compelling. And the way he shot Vera, I mean, she was shot twice in the abdomen, the miracle she survived. It, it is a miracle, and uh, it, as I say, it's, it's very vicious, and all three are lucky to be alive. He, he went off in this uh, sil silver saloon. You don't really know much more about it than that. No, I'm confident it's a silver vehicle. And you're confident, actually, that he's probably not from Liverpool because of his accent. Yes, his accent, and also the fact that he didn't take any steps to conceal his identity. Right, now the, the bag that he dropped, this isn't the, the actual one, because you're doing all sorts of forensic tests on, on the real one to try and recover DNA, as you say. But it's a, quite a common JD sports bag. There have been tens of thousands of these around the, around the country. Um, how can people help with that? Well, it's not my single point of appeal. Like you say, there's been tens and thousands. What I was ask is, can you associate that bag with that e-fit? Now, the victim's family, not these three, but the extended family, quite well known to the police uh, in Liverpool. That's quite well known in Merseyside. Yeah, I would say in the context of the extended family, yes, but I, mean, I really must stress to you that the, the three people involved here haven't a blemish. Um, they're innocent people, and what I want to be able to say to Makeda is that uh, the person that knocks on your door next time isn't the gunman, because somebody from Crime Watch has rung in and he's in prison. You're confident that somebody's really going to know who this guy is, doesn't come from Liverpool, you think, is a visitor, six foot, bulging eyes, not very good teeth, and thank God, not a very good shot by the looks of things. Yes. This is a man prepared to shoot a mum, a 19-year-old, and a six-year-old girl. Come on, for God's sake, give us his name. 0500 600 600 for us or call the incident room direct on 0151 treble 7 40 40. Or you can contact us by email through our website which is at bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. Also on the programme tonight... Hey, the, back! the handbag thieves who knocked down and drove over their victim. Posing as policemen, the thugs armed with a pistol and a stun gun. And the writings on the wall for graffiti vandals. Can you identify their signatures? Now, one in every three cases we feature on Crime Watch results in an arrest. And we've got such good progress to tell you about from last month, that arrest rate could go even higher. We reconstructed terrible scenes in a North London high street. Gavin McGrath died after an argument over queue jumping in McDonald's. We took 42 calls and one gave a name that created a new lead. As a direct result, eight days after Crime Watch, a man was charged with murder. Police were searching for Herbert Leslie, who was wanted for conspiracy to blackmail. We took nine calls, one said where he was. He's now in custody, awaiting trial. We had dramatic CCTV from one of Britain's most prestigious stores, which was flooded, causing a quarter of a million pounds worth of damage after someone set off a sprinkler. The footage we showed prompted several calls, and four hours after we came off the air, a man was charged with criminal damage. We had more CCTV from this bank in Essex, which a customer tried to defraud. Five viewers named a woman who was arrested three hours later. Fantastic, superb quality. It's obviously a riding crop that's been presented to a horse trainer in the late sort of 1850s. And great success with the antiques. Eleven and a half thousand pounds worth were identified by Crime Watch viewers, including this barograph and this brooch. As a result, Avon and Somerset police have charged a man and a woman with conspiracy to handle stolen goods. Now here's Detective Constable Jackie Haynes. Later in the programme, news of a high-profile anti-graffiti campaign and one of our CCTV clips this month shows some vandals in the act. Also, an attempted armed robbery, an audacious theft and a deception, all caught on camera. First, two men go into a bank to get some cash. Nothing unusual about that, except it was someone else's money. Wiltshire Police would very much like to speak to these two, who can be seen here withdrawing money from a building society in Salisbury using a stolen bank card. We know that they clocked up thousands of pounds on stolen cards across a number of banks and shops during this one afternoon in June. They're both described as having southern accents and said they were down on business from Watford. If you know who these two are, call us. Up to Coventry next and a different method of withdrawing cash. 
This man entered a NatWest bank with a gun and demanded money from shocked employees. He waved the gun at staff, but they were quick-thinking enough to duck behind the security screen and press the panic button. He ran from the bank empty-handed and escaped in a dark blue metallic Fiat Punto. Do you know who this hooded bandit is? Next, to Ashford, Kent, where two men bundled staff into the back room of an all-day's convenience store and threatened them with a claw hammer. They were so sure of themselves that one of the suspects removed his jacket and cap and served customers in the shop to avoid drawing attention to themselves. Meanwhile, his accomplice stood guard over the two frightened staff members for an unbelievable one and a half hours. They made off with telephone top-up cards, cigarettes, cash and spirits. If you know him or recognise his accomplice, then please do call. Finally, some surveillance footage shot by Manchester Transport Police as part of a local operation targeting railway graffiti. Back in June, these two, armed with paint cans, spent over two hours spraying some railway arches on Whitworth Street, Manchester. They're thought to be in their late teens to early 20s. If you can identify these two paint can Picassos, then please give us a call. 0500, 600, 600, if you can help with any of those cases. Maybe you were wondering why those two graffiti vandals weren't arrested there and then while they were being filmed, maybe we can tell you after they're convicted. Now, how would you react if someone tried to snatch something from you? Would you try to hang on to your possessions, however much danger that puts you in? The answer is, actually, you can't tell until it happens. We're going now to a street in Dulwich in South London and uh, a woman called Esther explains what she did when she was mugged. It was Saturday the 21st of June and I was due to fly to Los Angeles. I had a cab book for quarter to 12 and at 11 o'clock I decided we had enough time to, you know, just go down to the shops with my mum. I just need to go to the bookshop because I wanted to get something to read on the flight. Well, I'll catch up in a couple of minutes. OK. As I crossed over the roads, I noticed a car wanted to turn into the little slip road in front of the um, bookshop, and there was an old blue um, metro that was blocking the way with two young lads sat in it. It was quite loud. That's why I noticed them, you know, more than anything else. Excuse me, hi. Uh, do you have a copy of The Life of Pi? Yes, we do. Seven ninety nine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I'd taken my bag off my shoulder and had it in my hand at that stage, but didn't notice anything until just before it happened. My flight ticket, my passport, everything was in my handbag and that's all I thought about. And I just went after them. He's got my bag! I was coming down the main road in Dulwich called Croxted Road and um, it was because I had my window open I heard a woman shout something about a handbag. So uh, I noticed the fella, he was running away from her and he was moving quite fast. He went and jumped into a little blue mini metro, which was waiting by the Lloyds Bank. Look, just give me back my passport and tickets. You can take everything else. Just and I'm still, still pleading for him to give me my bag back, and he just sort of leant away, clutching my bag, so that I couldn't even grab it if I tried. And they started driving off with me hanging in there. As the car came towards me, I steered the bus across the road to make a bit of a roadblock out of it. I just fell down into the road. Um, and I was just lying there, thinking, I can't move. The driver went to put the car into reverse. Uh, he didn't make it immediately. Because they couldn't go forward, they tried to reverse and get out of the way, um, with me still lying, you know, in the way, basically. And my arm was out at an angle in, in the road, um, and I just watched the car reverse and watched the wheel just come towards me, thinking, I can't move out of the way, so what do I do? And it was just, it was like, oh, God, no.
They just left me lying in the road. Yeah, I hope so. Oh God, I hope so. I don't think they cared where I'd landed, you know, or where they hit me. I don't think they cared at all. Detective Constable Mike Nolan's now looking for them. Um, we didn't show the fact that, that Esther was, was knocked down. I mean, she was semi-conscious, unable to move on the floor there. That's right, yeah. She was, uh, the momentum of the car going forward, she was pushed to the front and actually knocked down um, by the people in the car, which pushed her onto the floor. And when they reversed, I mean, that was a very... And uh, they could have done a lot more damage than they did. They could have done. I mean, the, the wheel was very close to her head, a few inches the other way. We could be looking at a different inquiry. She at least got a good look at the guy who nicked the handbag. A very good look, yes. And this is the EFIT that, uh, that she can Tell us about him. What sort of age is he, height and all the rest? He's about five foot seven tall. Oh, so he's quite small. Yeah. Not a, a big guy. A very slim build as well. Um, he's uh, late teens, early twenties, and his hair is uh, sh very short cropped around the sides, strawberry blonde in colour, um, and the top was very fluffy. Uh, she, she mentioned that it's like you would have hair products in it but he didn't have any in that day. And the driver was pretty much the same age, I gather? Same age, but uh, dark features. The car was nicked. It had been a stolen car. So this, this was a premeditated crime. This wasn't something they did on the spur of the moment. That's right. It was stolen from Ballam a couple of days before, um, and quite obviously they were hanging around the area to commit a crime of some sort. What happened to it after the crime? Uh, we don't exactly know where it's gone straight after the crime, but it was recovered five days later from the Central Hill Estate in SE19. Have you got any witnesses who, who saw the car being left there? No, we haven't. That's what we'd be appealing for today. Now, we should say this is back, back in June. It, that, it was uh, back in June, yes. That this happened. The, there was a handbag that, that was stolen. I mean, it's very difficult for you to, to find things after they have been stolen, a Prada handbag, yeah. um, which looked like that, which <clears> people <throat> may be able to put in the possession of somebody who looked like the E-Fit, but... Yeah. I mean, how are viewers really going to be help, able to help I, I think the thing with that bag is that it is a designer label and it is very expensive. I mean, that would cost four to five hundred pounds. Um, had someone around that time been given that as a present, maybe, from someone who can't afford it, then yeah. that might sort of log in someone's mind. OK, we're a couple of really dangerous lunatics out there. Let's try and find them, please, tonight. Uh, give us a call. Here's our number. Or you can call the Instant Room on 020 7232 7213. Well, as we saw earlier, we reunited many of last month's antiques with their owners, seven in total. So let's see how many Crime Watch viewers recognise objects from this month's haul. These items could have belonged to people from anywhere in the UK, but in particular, the southwest of England. And Paul Hayes is here to tell us about them. Hello. Now, Paul, we've got a whole array of things here. And two beautiful old clocks. Yeah, the first one, though, that's an 18th century bracket clock, and it's the first type of portable clock. If you have Pretty a look, heavy. It has, <laughs> it has a carrying handle on the top, but it's designed to sit on a wall bracket, which is where it gets its name from. This one's solid mahogany. It's got what they call a square brass dial, but the unusual thing about it, it's just a single hole, or what they call a timepiece. There's no elaborate movement here at all. It's very, very simple, and that's worth probably 15 to £2,000. Really? And, and quite old, I imagine. Are you looking about 1700 maybe 1720 something really? old, yes. Really? And if someone wants to claim this as theirs, what's the one thing they can identify what about it that no one else can? <laughs> what we've covered up on the front there is actually the maker's name. That's what we're going to look for. It's quite a prominent maker. Hopefully someone will recognise it. And I was looking through these earlier, and this caught me because I couldn't quite work out what this was. This is beautiful. This is a Victorian lady's calling card case. And the idea was you'd keep your calling cards in there, and then to announce your arrival, you would give oh, them I to see. the butler of the house. And the more elaborate they are, the higher status as you were. This one is solid silver. It's what they call a castle top. It has these prominent views of castles or country houses found around the British Isles. It's been gold plated, wonderful quality, and it's solid silver. Fantastic thing. So what value would this be? You're looking 800 to a thousand pounds. People collect them for the particular views. Fantastic. And what what is it about this? Is it the, the, the hallmarks, is it that someone can identify? What we're looking for is the specific year. Yeah, the hallmarks, these are all hallmarks of a specific year, that's what we're looking for. OK. Now, some weapons here. We get all sorts of weapons on cars. <laughs> Don't often get to see something like this, do we? Well, these are very old. These are actually from, from Arabia. You've got what they call a, a jambaya here, which is like this curve-shaped blade here. Uh, similar to this flintlock pistol here in its decoration, we've got what they call mother-of-pearl inlay with brass sort of spandles, if you like. Uh, wonderful quality, dates 1800, 1820. The flintlock pistol is now a dated item. People do collect those. Very unusual piece. And what would these be worth? Uh, you're probably looking 300 to £500 pounds for the pair. 
And again, what's the single identifying feature about these? Uh, we're looking for, I'm not going to give away too much, looking for something <laughs> specific about that particular weapon. But if, if they belong to someone, that person will know for yes. sure. Now, this caught my eye because this kind of thing, the vanity case like this, but it's the sort of thing my grandmother might have had. Well, that's right. I mean, this is typically what you find in the 19th century. This is what they call a tortoise shell vanity set. Now, did you know a tortoise shell isn't actually from a tortoise? No. It's from a rare breed of sea turtle. Well, there you <laughs> are. <laughs> but this one is heat treated so it bends and it, so it can fit into this wonderful silver case here. We have a mirror, we have two uh, hair brushes, we have the clothes brushes, and it's what they call pico decoration. We have this silver inlay here, and it's wonderful to find it in its original case. That's very rare to find that. OK. Now, what about this as well? This tankard, is it? Yeah, this is a tankard. Oh, fantastic quality. This is Russian silver. Now, it's not Carl Fabergé. It would be worth thousands it of It would pounds, be worth an awful lot, yeah. But it is a very good maker. But what I love about this, what's very, very unusual, you have this sleigh or this chariot here riding through the snow. Can you see that? Yeah. You've got the whole family on the back of these horses. It's been gilded inside. It's what they call card-cut decoration. Fantastic quality. And um, we're looking for the hallmark again on that to give the exact year of manufacture. All righty. And the value of it? That looking probably 300 to 500 pounds. Oh, so it's an expensive piece. Now this, what's this? Because I couldn't work this out. This is a hydrometer. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> These are still not the wider. Well, These are used by customs and, office, customs and excise officers. And the idea is it te tests the density of alcohol. And what you would do is submerge this into the, the, the cask, if you like, of the liquid. You'd attach one or two of these weights to it. But first of all, you would actually check the temperature, which affects the density. And then it would register on a chart to see whether the liquid has been watered down or any impurities Amazing. has been added to it. Fantastic. But these were issued to customs officers right the way up until the 1960s, 1970s. So, but they all have an individual number. To right, like so the person has to know this. And again, is this valuable? Uh, you're looking 80 to 120 pounds for that particular piece. Quite a dated right. item okay. now. Well, all these things will mean something to whoever belonged to them. If you know, uh, if you recognise any of these things, you think you can claim them, call us now. And our DC Jackie Hames is over by the phones with Chief Superintendent Jeremy Payne. Uh, first up, reaction to that appalling shooting of the Weaver family in Liverpool on the 2nd of November, just two and a half weeks ago. Thankfully, a unique case. Um, lots of calls coming in, I'm glad to say, on that. But what's clear is the fear that people have in ringing. So if you don't want to give your name, please, you can ring the Crime Stoppers number 0800 555 one and give your information. Or you can give us your uh, information anonymously here as well. So don't fear, have that fear before you ring. We've had lots of names. One, um, a lady giving her, the name of her boyfriend, somebody giving some information about an overheard conversation. And uh, one, one, some information that's be vital actually about a man re released from prison who's known to have a similar uh, revolver and is a very strong likeness to the uh, EFIT. So, some tremendous information coming in on that. Well, it's early days yet, but I've been following progress on that robbery in East Dulwich where the woman had her handbag snatched and was then run over by those um, the, the, by the car driven by the fleeing robbers. Now, that M Reg Metro was stolen just two days before the attack, and I wouldn't mind betting that the same two men have been using that car, not necessarily in London, it could have been anywhere, and maybe that they were involved in crime, because they certainly weren't shy about drawing attention to themselves, as we could see by that shouting match outside the shop. What happened to that expensive handbag? Just give me a name and we'll do the rest. Now then, the studio number is on the screen, and if you're watching on digital satellite TV, you can email us directly through your remote control. Just press the red button on your handset and choose Crime Watch. Coming up on Crime Watch, the, the violent thieves who were scared off by a woman's wig. And this is what graffiti writers did to the Hotwalks Express. How you can identify some of Britain's worst vandals. Two thugs and a haul of stolen watches, but an armed robbery with a difference. Not only was a gun used, but one of these. Now, you may not have seen anything like this before, but it's a stun gun. It can deliver a 50,000 volt electric shock. Guns like these are illegal in Britain under the Firearms Act. In fact, you can get 10 years in prison just for owning one, let alone using it. Morning. 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 Come on, we better get a move on. We haven't even finished dressing the window yet. Yeah, sorry I was late. Nah, we all were today. I've been a partner at Royal Arcade Watches for eight years now. We buy and sell high quality pre owned watches. We're, we're very careful where we buy our watches and, and, and who brings them into us. And up until now, we, we've, we've never really had a problem. I remember on that day, one of my colleagues' cousins was actually downstairs in the basement working on our website. We were putting a few watches into the display 
when there was a loud bang at the door, on the glass part of the door. Police! Open up! I saw their badges and they showed me the search warrants, so I let them in. And Anthony Phillips has admitted selling new watches that were stolen in a robbery where an old woman was attacked. I've got him in custody and a warrant to search these premises. I don't recall it, Anthony Phillips. It was Look, definitely an embarrassing feeling. I just more. wanted to get them inside and try and figure out what this was all about. Look, I want to sort this out. Can we talk something more privately? Yes, let's go downstairs. I'm just going to lock the cabinet. Don't touch anything! And keep your hands where I can see them. I have to lock the cabinets for security reasons if we're going to be downstairs. I was quite annoyed by his attitude. Um, and so I pretty much ignored his instruction and I locked the cabinets anyway because I wanted to see what was happening downstairs and, and know more about the situation before I just relinquished control to them. Right. We think you've been selling stolen watches. I've just come from a robbery where two old people have had their watches taken. They're both in hospital. The old lady may die. I'm sorry, but what's that got to do with us? This could turn into a murder inquiry. As I came downstairs, Danny and the white guy were discussing this list of watches that they'd produced with corresponding serial numbers, which they claimed were a list of stolen watches, and we were meant to have had these watches on our premises. Look, we want to help. You can go through all our watches. No, you can go through the watches. Now this Cartier Panther, man or woman's? I don't know, you check. When we got into the basement, the black man behind me kept pestering me for that cabinet key, and it made me suspicious. And I thought, well, let me recheck their ID. I want to see your ID. I haven't seen your ID properly. Oh! The white guy hauled out a menacing looking stun gun. They pushed me to the ground, they shot me with the stun gun a few times. Oh, get down there! Get down! The black guy hauled out a, a pistol which he had aimed at Danny's head. Get down! Then it was just a melee, it was complete confusion and, and screaming and shouting. The worst thing for me was to actually see my colleague Justin sort of shout out in pain. Um, I felt very responsible and I, I felt helpless, you know, when they were doing that to him. I, I, I couldn't help him in, in, in any way. Get in the kitchen! Move! Where's the keys? It's fallen out of my pocket. Open the safe! It is open. I'm lying across it. That's why it went open. Move! Ah! Upstairs, their colleague Simon spotted the robbery on the shop security cameras. Go on, get in there, I said. Get in there. This is Royal Arcade Watches. There's been a disturbance. What are you calling? Get it, 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 get it. We were very compliant. We did exactly what they wanted us to do. We didn't try and resist them, um, and yet their level of aggression seemed to escalate. We were trying to cooperate with them, and yet they were very brutal. Look, I've got a gun. Anybody moves, I get shot, all right? They've called the police. we got to get out. Give me the keys. Give me the keys. Give me the keys. They'd asked Simon for the key, which he had given them, but they didn't realise this, and they, they just kept asking for, the, for this key. They were confused. We're locked in. Where are the keys? Come on, you. Come with me. Get us out of here. I'll let you out. I thought it would be a good time to go upstairs to try and delay them and, and make out that somehow I could let them out. Um, but really, I was just trying to get someone's attention, trying to get help. I know what your game is. You're going to get yourself shot. The white man punched me three times. By then, the black guy had managed to get the door open and, and they both ran out. A third man, believed to be the getaway driver, was seen running away with the robbers as they came out of the arcade onto Albemarle Street. The witness also saw the gang drive off in a dark blue Vauxhall Zafira before turning left into Grafton Street, where they stopped for 10 seconds. They then carried on into Hay Hill. Financially, it's a big blow. We've probably lost over a quarter of a million pounds of stock and this includes customers' watches. Emotionally, you do find yourself waking up in the middle of the night and reenacting the whole scene again and again and again, thinking, you know, what you could have done differently. You, you just feel completely devastated. 
Well, DCI Kevin Desmond is in charge of the case. Kevin, there was a horrifying level of violence that we saw there. What can you tell us about the men that did this? It certainly was. It was a very professional uh, gang of criminals that committed this offence. Um, it's an unusual pairing of, of suspects, we believe. Certainly the, the white suspect, 50 to 55, about 5 foot 8 tall, stocky build, London accent, uh, short grey hair, receding and swept back. Um, the second suspect that went into the actual premises, a black man, 6 foot 2, slim, uh, medium sort of build and quite athletic as well. Uh, again with a London accent. The pairing's unusual. The method, uh, the planning that went into it. Exactly, because they obviously put an awful lot of work into it, because they knew, you know, Danny, they knew your name, for example, and they had a search when they had false police ID. What does that tell us about them? Certainly they've done a lot of research to actually be able to carry out the crime, to actually gain access to the premises. And it was on that basis that obviously the robbery took place. So, yes, it was very well planned. And what about the getaway car? The getaway car is a dark blue Vauxhall Sephira uh, YF51 2KD. This was actually parked in Albemarle Street and actually drove off towards Grafton Street and we believe there was a third white man as a getaway driver in the vehicle. Okay. Well, well, Danny, we saw you there in the reconstruction, you were a partner in the, mm. in the shop. It must have been absolutely horrifying for you, particularly the use of a stun gun. It was. It was, it was very, very frightening. They, they used the stun gun both on myself and my colleague several times. Um, I remember it was, it was like a, a severe electric shot running through your body. Um, I felt it, it was totally unnecessary. Yes, it's not like you were putting up any resistance, is it? No, it was, it, was, it, was, it was unnecessary and it was just extremely frightening. Now, you've lost a lot of stock, as we heard there. Just Tell us just about some of the watches that have been taken. Yeah, um, this is a stainless steel Rolex Daytona from 1968. has a black face, three inner white dials. The serial number is 2552193. Also taken was a steel and gold Rolex Turnograph. It's got a blue diamond dial, and the serial number is K218363. Also is a rose gold Vacheron Constantin triple calendar. Very few of these watches were ever produced. Um, this is a, an extremely rare watch. So it's likely if someone's been offered something like that, mm. it, it's quite possible it could have come from your shop. Very, very much so. OK, Danny. Well, see if you can put all those things together. A black man, a white man, a handgun, a stun gun, a blue Vauxhall Zafira, and those rare watches. You saw just three of them there. 0500 600 600 or call the instant room on 020 8247 7931. Last month, this was on display in London's Tate Britain Gallery, hanging next to a 19th century landscape painting, at least it was, until the glue sticking this to the wall gave way. And only when the thing crashed to the floor did the rather embarrassed staff realise that a, a visitor had stuck it there. He called the work, Crime Watch UK has ruined the countryside for all of us, and claims it's a beautiful example of the neo-post-idiotic style. But there's a new campaign starting today targeted at people who really are ruining the countryside and our towns and cities too. We tend on Cromwich to deal with rather big offences, but surveys show what angers most people most of the time are the daily hassles, and they often single out graffiti. Graffiti probably costs the country, believe it or not, about a quarter of a billion pounds a year cleaning it up. Curbing graffiti was one of the first things they did in New York when turning around the place from vandalism and high crime to one of the safest cities in America. So starting today in Britain, the police are compiling a database to pin down who's causing all the damage. And if you hate graffiti yourself, this is where you can do something about it. You will see a poster campaign to encourage people to report who's causing all this graffiti. They're offering £500 rewards. This is Chief Inspector Dave Dickerson. He's standing in front of graffiti that's been copied. We've actually put it onto a London Underground train. Yes. London Underground suffers hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of damage. But this is from all over the country, this stuff. Tell us about some of it and how Crime Watch viewers can help, Dave. Well, Nick, first of all, this one here, which actually says the. That's the? The. T-H-E. Th -E, right. Um, it's predominant in the Manchester area. Now, a tag like T-H-E is it's basically their signatures. Look at me. It's... This is me, yeah? Absolutely. And does T-H-E, I can't see the T-H-E there, but that's fairly typical. This is the way he does it at the bottom half of the train, is it? That's very typical, except in July of this year, um, we believe that this individual went to Gorok in, uh, near, near Glasgow and actually produced the same amount of, of graffiti, but showing the, the letters complete. And is that likely to be his initials, T-H-E, or is that just a 
a tag that they'll go for. It's possibly his initials, but it could just be equally just a tag. But somebody somewhere will recognise And this. his main area, OK, so he's, he's been near Glasgow. What's his main area of operation? It's, it's, the, London, it's the Manchester area. And if you take just one of these attacks, take the, take the Glasgow one, how much did that cost to clean up? That's £10,000. Just, just for that one, just, just bit, for of, that one bit, bit of damage. Bit of spray, I guess. And this one? This one's interesting because we have a video footage of this one. This says SCAR, S-C-A-R. Now take us through the, the video and, and, and what it's showing us. Yes, uh, as you'll see, you've got a, a train which is absolutely clean. You've got an individual who gets onto the train and causes immense damage. And he's been doing this, I mean, this is mostly in London, this guy? This is in London and in the London Borough of Barnet, where there's extensive damage being caused to council property. Now, presumably, because this is so distinctive, because these individuals mm. tend to put this tag, mm. the signature, anywhere, teachers might see this on, on school books, parents yes. might yes. notice this around the house, yes. friends will know who is doing yes. this. Somebody somewhere will recognise this tonight, I've no doubt about that, Nick. And all we can say is, please give us a call and let us know who it is. Graffiti causes a fear of crime in people. It affects the quality of life of, well, virtually everybody in the country. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned New York. It really is very, very highly correlated with crime it in is. there. Presumably because people see the place looking dreadful. Yes. And they take less care of themselves. They don't yes. intervene and all, yes. and all the rest of it. I don't know. What about, what about this one? AMZ. AMZR. Ah, oh, I yes. see. Yes. Yep. Yeah. From the Liverpool area, uh -huh. predominantly in the Liverpool area, but in fact he has been active as an individual in Southport and also as far as Buxton as well. This one's been active for about a year now, but has caused in excess of £20,000 worth of damage. That you know of? That we know of, correct. And how long do they normally go on doing this? Is it just something that's done for a couple of years? or? Well, one would imagine that these people would be, to grow would, out of it, really. would be young. Yeah. But they're not. Some of them are in their early 20s. They obviously haven't grown out of it. And they're doing it... I and mean, we saw some video earlier on of, a, of two boys doing this together. Yes. This, this becomes a gang thing, uh, a thing that they do as a group, or are many of them loners? Or is it just a whole mix and match? It's a mix and match, Nick. It's a mix and match. But somebody watching tonight will recognise these. And, of course, there's £500 reward offered in each of these three tags um, under the Home Office initiative for information leading to the conviction of the person who's responsible for this damage. OK, well, the government really is beginning to take this very seriously indeed. Please, call us on these three, but not just on those three. If you know who's doing graffiti round where you live, if you recognise any of the tags, if you can trace them back to people you know, please call us. The number is on the screen, or you can email us at crimewatch at bbc.co.uk. We can text us if you want. The number is 077 86 200 060. OK, just text crime at the beginning of your message. And incidentally, it's not only on public transport that uh, these graffiti people are, are doing all their work. This is one of the most famous trains in the world. It's the Hogwarts Express from the Harry Potter films. Back in September, it was badly damaged while in sidings at its home in Scarborough. When it's not in the movies, the train does scenic tours between Scarborough and York. But it was out of action for weeks because of this damage. It cost several thousand pounds to clean it. However, if you are a JK Rowling fan, you'll be pleased to know it's now back in service for the third Harry Potter film. But if you know who sabotaged it, please give us a call. Now here's Chief Superintendent Jeremy Payne. I've got four faces for you. All these people are wanted by police forces across the UK. Anthony Carl Prestige is British, but he's wanted in Australia for the murder of his brother-in-law. Now, Scotland Yard Extradition Unit believe he may be in London. There are reports of a sighting in Notting Hill, but there's also rumours that he could be in either Edinburgh or Glasgow. Anthony Prestige has got a Scottish accent, tattoos on both arms, and the one on his right arm has the initials JNS and a distinctive scar on his forehead. So tell us where he is. And this is Adnan Mohammed, who also uses the name Adnan Ahmed. Now, the police in Rochdale are looking for him following the abduction and rape of a woman. Adnan Mohammed is muscly with thick black hair in the curtain style that you can see here. He has thick black eyebrows and is known to wear a heavy gold chain on his left wrist. We know he was in Rochdale for a couple of weeks before the offence took place, but he could be anywhere now. If you know where, then give us a call. And next, Anthony Harrington, or it could be Anthony Waywell, Anthony Lunt, 
Well, Bradley Harrington, he failed to appear at Liverpool Crown Court last week, charged with manufacturing firearms. And he's also wanted for attempted murder. Anthony Harrington is unemployed and is probably still in Merseyside. He's six foot tall and has a number of scars, including some on the back of his right hand. Although his hair is dark in this photograph, he may have dyed it red or blonde. Anthony Harrington is extremely dangerous, so please do not approach him. Call us instead. And finally, Mir Akbar Baz, who's wanted by West Yorkshire Police for offering to supply heroin. Mir Akbar Baz has been missing for over a year. He's probably still in the northeast of England, and we're keen to hear from clubbers, as he often goes to nightclubs, particularly in Leeds. Now, he may have grown a beard since this photograph was taken. Call us, 0500 600, if you've seen any of these four men. Crime Watch viewers often help police track down wanted faces like those. But some cases are solved independently of the programme. Here are a few of them. This is James Boyle. We showed his photo back in June last year. James Boyle is wanted in connection with a series of distraction burglaries against the elderly. Viewers couldn't help, but a police officer did. He was booked for driving without due care and attention. They quickly realised who he was, and in July, James Boyle was sentenced to 27 months. This is Stephen Franks, whom we featured back in March. He'd been due to appear at court charged with possession of a large calibre machine gun. He was given bail, but when the court case started to go against him, he disappeared. In his absence, he was sentenced to five years. He went on to the top ten of the Met's most wanted criminals, and in the end, a tip-off led police to Wapping, East London. Stephen Franks is now serving his sentence, plus another year for going on the run. Fabian Fatinikan was wanted for kidnap and assault. A call into Crime Watch told police he was in the Coventry area. But by coincidence, he was arrested by West Midlands police on a separate charge. That case was later dropped. Scotland Yard brought him back to London to stand trial for his original offence. In September, Fabian Fatinikan was found guilty of two charges of blackmail and sentenced to four years. Still on cases solved, a big manhunt has been brought to an end, this time thanks to a single Crime Watch viewer. And as a result, this man, Barry Shaw, has been sentenced to eight years for a long series of sex assaults. Since we don't know that viewer's name, the person who solved this case, here by way of thanks to her is the story of just how much she achieved. Be the search warrant. Barry Shaw, I'm arresting you for a series of sex attacks on females across South East London. No problem. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you fail to mention when... Uh, the case had been featured on Crime Watch uh, a week before. We'd been looking for the offender for six months. I think someone's coming into the flat. We had partial DNA samples uh, from the scenes and some CCTV footage, but we really didn't know who was committing these offences. Within days of receiving the Crime Watch call, we were knocking on Barry's door. Hello, yeah, I'm calling about the sex attacker. I'm not certain, but I think his name's B.N. Shaw, and he lives in Helsinki Square. After the Crime Watch programme, we received about 60 calls, uh, most of those giving names, uh, and we were able to trace and eliminate uh, a lot of those people. No, this one isn't right. We've eliminated him already. Uh, and we were left with a sort of hardcore group of people. Uh, one of which included Barry. Oh, there's a Barry Shaw over at Helsinki Square. This is interesting. He's got some previous form and he lives in the right area. When we looked up Barry Shaw's previous convictions, uh, we soon discovered that back in the 1980s, uh, at the age of 15, he'd been convicted of rape, uh, where he'd climbed into a lady's bedroom and raped her. He received six years for that. Uh, that was obviously prior to our DNA database. Uh, as soon as we found that out, we were extremely interested in him. When we started looking at Barry, uh, we confirmed that he lived there uh, in Helsinki Square uh, and that he did look very similar to the CCTV footage. 
it, it was quick for us to realise that uh, he, he didn't live a nine to five routine and was laying in late most mornings. Army defence, if you fail to mention when questioned, something that you like to rely on in court. When we arrested Barry, uh, even though we'd smashed in through his front door, uh, he was very calm and relaxed, as if he'd been expecting us to arrest him. I remember noticing there were uh, chess boards, chess books, and even chess timers. It wasn't at all what we'd been expecting. Then I walked into a bedroom. Uh, it, it was full of computer parts and monitors. We sort of expected that because we knew that he'd been a computer programmer before. Then I spotted something that uh, really made me think. Uh, it was a set of judo suits. Uh, that's when it came back to me what some of the victims had said. We're all going to stay calm. <laughs> We're just going to lie here for five minutes. He knew exactly where to lay us so we couldn't try and fight. Of course, anyone that's good at judo would know exactly how to pin people down. Can I have my chess books to read? No. When Barry was being led away, uh, he'd asked for some chess books. Initially, we were suspicious, thinking there may be something hidden in them. We checked them and they were fine. It seems he was just a chess fan. Now, these pictures were taken near Globe Wharf, which isn't far from where you live. I'm saying this is a picture of you, except you've changed your jacket. Was this what was in the show? The crime watch show? Yeah. I think it's you on your way to indecently assaulting and burgling a woman on the 21st of September. What? Is that what you think? Yeah, that's what I think. And I'm putting the allegation to you. Did you do that? No. Look, can I have a break? I'd like to call my mum. Hello, mum? Yeah, I'm fine. After Barry called his mum, uh, he seemed to have a change of heart. He came back and started uh, admitting everything. This is a booklet of CCTV stills we've shown you before, and you made comments about them. Can you make your comments about them now? I believe it's me, yeah. My clothes. The coat you're wearing in this still, do you know where that coat is now? I did throw it away. Where did you throw it away? In our dustbins. When? I think the very night of the Crime Watch programme, basically. When we took Barry's DNA sample and compared it against the samples from the crime scenes, it matched and the scientists informed us later that there was a one in seven million chance that that sample could have come from someone else. Most of the victims didn't believe the offender would ever get caught and weren't too keen on taking part in the Crime Watch show but it was just from one caller into Crime Watch that led us direct to Barry Shaw. And thanks to her. One redeeming feature, the fact that uh, Barry Shaw pleaded guilty meant at least the victims didn't have to go through the ordeal of giving evidence. But the judge was nonetheless given statements from the victims describing how they'd been affected, and he said it made harrowing reading. Now, anabolic steroids are used by bodybuilders. You get them on the black market. I wonder if they ever stop to wonder where the drugs have come from. Maidley is a village not far from Telford, and John Bowden was known and popular with almost everyone. But in his 60s, he had to have a heart transplant. He had a lot of um, drugs to take, steroids, and uh, they were very expensive, £500 a box and luckily National Health paid. But I think if we had to, we'd have paid somehow just to keep him with us. It was a Thursday night. I called my daughter, Jacqueline. I always say, phone her last thing at night to say goodnight. And as I was on the phone to Jacqueline, bang came at the door. Anne has been quite ill herself. She has to wear a wig and suffers badly from swelling and ulcers to her legs. Even today, I don't know why I opened the door. It's easy to think things after. Where's John? What the steroids? I mean, they wanted John's drugs, but John had been dead 18 months then. He's 
Don't be stupid. He is, he died 18 months ago. <laughs> oh, please, please get me out the door. I, I, I can prove it to you. I've got the death certificate. Unless you have ulcerated legs, nobody knows what the pain you get from them. While the intruders argued in desperation, and struggled into the living room to find John's death certificate. If she could prove he was dead and there were no steroids, maybe they'd leave. But he, he just knocked him out of my hand, and, and I thought, I'm going to get some more now. But my wig come off in the run. Whether it frightened him or what, I don't know. But I'd say it saved me. Yo, come in. No. They took my drugs. I mean, my jewellery was on the side. Um, my purse was there. But they didn't take anything, nothing at all, just my drugs. I was getting my life back together after John had died. And uh, things, although it wasn't the same, they were looking a bit more rosy. And then after... They came that night. I locked in my own house. I'm a prisoner in my own house. Well, dear Steve Alcock from West Mercia Police is investigating this case. Steve, what are we to make of the fact they obviously had some information um, because they knew about John, but their information was 18 months out of date? Yes, we were very surprised that they didn't know that he had in fact died. Um, and we think there may be two possibilities for this. The first one being that they used to live in the area and have moved out. Uh, and also the fact that they may have been serving a term of imprisonment. And so that's why they didn't know. Yeah. And what can you tell us about them? Well, we've got a good description of the, uh, the ringleader. He's a white male, five foot nine inches tall, a medium build, and he had a tanned complexion. He's got uh, collar length, straight, dark brown, greasy hair. And the most distinctive thing about him, he has a scar on his left cheek, three to four inches long, that runs up from the corner of his mouth. So we think that he is quite distinctive and we're sure that there are viewers out there who may recognise this person and we'd like them to give us a call if they do. And in terms of accents for both of them, both had uh, uh, West Midlands accents. accents, yes. Right. Now this is, is some of the stuff, or, 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 or copies of some of the stuff they took, these are Anne's drugs, which would have been completely useless to them, wouldn't they? Absolutely, yes. They were clearly after uh, her husband John's steroids, uh, which weren't there. And so they, they ended up taking these drugs here, which were absolutely no use to them whatsoever. I suppose it's just possible that someone, they might have tried to flog some of these, they're just kind of painkillers and a, an anointment that you, you put in the bath to, to moisturise your skin, that kind of thing. Yeah. Again, if, if, if anybody has, has been offered these drugs to, to sell or somebody knows that somebody who's got them and hasn't been prescribed, then we need to know about it. Now, if they had got hold of anabolic steroids, which is what they were after, where would they have tried to sell that kind of thing? Um, anabolic steroids are mainly used for the building up of muscle mass um, and so they're, they're generally traded in gymnasiums. So if people have seen them perhaps being uh, traded in gymnasiums, someone's seen a bit of black marketeering going on, or what if someone actually uses them and is reluctant to come forward even though they could, they could name the dealers? Indeed, we need to know who's dealing this stuff um, and, and if there's somebody out there who is using it, we're not after them, we want the dealers, so if they are using it, no need to worry, get in touch with us, let us know who's you selling won't take the product. That any further. We won't take it any further. OK, Steve, well, thanks very much. If you can help, you know the number to call, 0500 600 600. Maybe you can see behind me the lines are still very busy. We've had a lot of calls on the shooting of the six-year-old, her brother and her mum in Liverpool. Twelve names, we've given dresses, details. Uh, one woman says, or one person says, thinks it's a member of uh, their own family. On the railway bridge, graffiti, six people have offered names. Uh, one person has been named twice on the others. We've had dozens of names on the other graffiti. And again, uh, one name has come in twice. Um, on the Dulwich robbery, do you remember the woman who was uh, the handbag snatched, then she was run over but during the escape? We've had 18 names. Three people with that have come in with the same name, at least it's the same first name. I've got to check whether all the surnames are the same. On the antiques, we think we've probably identified who owns the square face clock. We've got information from a police officer, a whole bunch of other stuff coming in. And um, on the uh, Bond Street jewellery, we've a name given for the white robber. And finally, bent bubbles. With the festive season fast approaching, many of us are beginning to shop for Christmas. Well, that's if you're very organised. And that often means buying drinks. But if you do feel like celebrating, you're offered a bottle or two of this. Beware. Last month, a few bottles of this champagne, Verve 
Morsigny it's called, was stolen from a trailer in Gloucestershire. 11,202 bottles to be precise. And this lot represents just one of 24 pallets stolen. The trailer was parked in a trading estate in Stonehouse near Stroud when it was stolen sometime during the night of the 26th of October. The thieves attached it to a stolen lorry cab, which was taken from a nearby road. This is what the trailer looked like. It was found almost two weeks later, dumped on the A46 near Coventry in Warwickshire, minus the champagne. Now, the Verve Monsigny, which usually retails at 8 dollars a bottle,